Hey, listen, we've been in this John thing for a long time. I'm going to go back because we're going to close down this little mini series that broke out in John chapter number seven. All right. And I, I want you to get the scripture. Let's look at it. We've been doing this uh, for probably months now through John, but we've we've gotten hung up here on building a life of purpose, right? And we've said this, we've titled this series in the middle of this called A Life That's a Threat to Hell. A life that's a threat to what Satan wants to do in people's lives. I better lay this pen down. I'm too excited. I'll probably throw it. All right, the thing is, is listen, in our lives, a lot of times, everything that's going on around you, the battles, the trials, the circumstances that you find yourself in that you didn't plan, those things are either a test from God or they are a design attack against the plan of God. All right, now understand this. I want you to get it. If you're going through evil things in your life today, all right, remember what James teaches us, that God is not tempted with evil, neither does he tempt others with evil. I, I taught our teenagers about four months ago on a Wednesday night. I, I said, hey, look, we got to realize there's a difference between a test and a trial. You got to learn how to recognize what's a test, what's a trial. Will God test you? Come on now. Yes. You know, I hear people say all the time, don't pray for patience. You know, because if you pray for patience, God's going to test it. And they totally misuse James 1. By the way, whether you pray for it or not, God's going to test your patience. Why? Because you need it. I mean, hey, 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 guess what? God's going to test your finances. And it's not your finances he's testing. It's your faith. And he's going to say, hey, do you trust me? Uh, be, I'll be honest with you, and I want you to grab this. If you're making a step in God's direction, it's going to come with two things. It's going to come with a test. God's going to say, how? me, but it's also going to come with a trial. That's an attack where Satan says, I ain't going to let you go. Like, I don't want you to do this. And so we've been looking at this, the three things you need to find in your life, your identity, all right, what you were made to be. Um, I, I, I told uh, our teenagers, about 30 of them on Monday, we've been doing this series through moods, um, the different moods you'll experience in life and how to handle those. Um, we ended with the mood of anger, and, and we realized, and we took the Gethsemane story, and we broke it down how Jesus experienced a lot of the emotions that we experience. He experienced anxiety. He experienced loneliness. He experienced abandonment. He experienced anger. He experienced all these things. So here's the truth. You can have anxiety. You can have loneliness. You can have fear. You can have anger and not be far from God. Jesus never sinned, yet still experienced his emotions. All right. Can you write that in your notes somewhere? I am not messed up because I feel this way, but I don't need to let how I feel mess me up. All right, and so we were talking about anger and we were saying, hey, part of fighting anger, you want to combat your anger in your life. You, the, the, the Bible gives us an antidote. Of course, it's talking about listening in parts of the Bible, but it also says be humble. Hey, it tells us to be unselfish. It's hard to be angry and sin when you're trying to be humble and unselfish. Hey, hey, would you agree? Most of your anger turns into sin when you're thinking of yourself. All right, how many of your arguments, examine your arguments. You are not arguing because of what they did. You are arguing because of how you feel. And we argue our emotions. We argue our feelings. And when we become selfish, that argument can turn into fatal relationship. It can turn into regretful action, regretful words. And so Jesus actually even, they wrote it through Paul, be angry, but sin not. So let me tell you this, in your identity journey, and I was teaching them this and saying, hey, when I ask adults, and even myself, who are you? What do you enjoy? What do you live for? The number one answer I get is, I don't know. I don't know. And if I were to ask some of you, and I don't want you to raise your hand, uh, and if you were to ask me at the right time in my life, there's certain seasons of my life that it's just, I don't know who I am. Anybody else just nod your head? You ever been there? Maybe they're now. And some of the seasons in my life, it's like, I don't like who I am. Come on now. Anybody ever feel good after an argument? Even if you win, it still doesn't feel good. Right? We, we've joked around for years, and I, I still haven't made it, but we need to. Uh, the, the thing that would solve our, our marriage problems is if we actually awarded a trophy in our home when we won the fight. You know? And, and just been like, hey, here you go. You win. You get to carry this, and you have to tell all your friends how you earned your trophy, right? Like, hey, I really, I got her this week. I Googled and won, right? Like, this is it. Yeah, would, you, would you really feel good about yourself? 
uh, we were watching the Alabama game last night, and uh, there was a commercial. Progressives got this new commercial to where they throw a red flag, which in football means replay, challenge. And it was a father and a son, and the son was making fun of the dad for screaming over a spider. Anybody seen this commercial? And, and he's like, you scream so loud. And he's like, I didn't scream at all. And he's like, should I do it? And he drops it. And Jordan's like, I need one of those. You know, she, she literally, she said it. And I was like, you know what? You, you need to get over yourself. All right, here's the thing. Listen, in our relationships, when I start thinking about me more than you, I lose myself, and I definitely lose sight of you. Um, identity, identity, identity. God did not make you to walk around this earth feeling like you are worthless. God did not make you to walk through life feeling like you were insignificant. God did not create you to be invisible. And God did not create you to be silent. God did not create you for you to think that you are what you've done or what somebody else has done to you. God did not create you for you to live an entire existence in hiding because of everything that's happened. Adam and Eve, when they took a bite of the fruit, they lost their identity. And you know what, the very first conversation that Adam had with God was we hid because we were what? Naked. We hid because we were naked. And God's response was, who told you you were naked? You know what that was? A loss of identity. Before then, it didn't matter. That was the way that God intended it. Before then, that wasn't even on the radar. But the moment they gave up their identity to try to get a new one, that's what Satan tried to do with Eve and Adam. By the way, we always say when Eve ate, you get the scriptures, the Bible says, and Adam ate with her. He was there. And, and, I, and I told our guys this, um, and we, we spend a lot of time trying to train up our children, right? Train them up in the way they should go. And when they're old, what? They won't depart from it. Our churches must not be in a good job because 75% of them are departing. All right? And so understand, we've got to put the gospel in front of them. So I, by the way, pause. We do not try to teach sermons to our teenagers that entertain them. We try to teach them biblical truth because they will depart from entertainment when they find something more entertaining. They will build on truth, and that's what they need. You are never too young to understand the principles of God. Why? Because the principles of God establish safe living. Are you with me? So Adam ate with her, and I told them Adam's identity in the moment was in Eve. Eve's identity in the moment was trying to be closer to God. If that doesn't sound like the modern day church, I don't know what it is. There's three to one women and wives coming to church when it comes to wives compared to husbands, when it comes to women compared to men. If you don't agree with it, come look at our small groups. If we divide our small groups into men and women, and we did a men and women Bible study and a men and women small group, there will be way more women than there are men. Why? Because men are finding their identity and their value of the women, and the women are the ones seeking God. Hey, Adam should have stepped up and said, hey, I'm going to be a leader in this moment, and I'm not going to find my identity in you and what God's, what, what Satan's trying to do in your life. I'm going to protect you from what Satan's trying to do. And I'm going to know this, that God made me, that's what he made Adam, to be the facilitator of this garden, to be the protector of this garden, to be the nurturer of this garden. And so I'm going to stand in my garden with God and I'm not going to let the enemy in. But that's not what happened, is it? Hey, listen, stop trying to find who you are and someone else's opinions of you. Stop trying to find who you are and what everybody else says you should be. Um, uh, my little girl came out yesterday in scrubs that her grandma has made for her. My wife's been a nurse her entire professional career up until this year. And, um, and so Kanan loves to play doctor. She's got two little um, bags. I don't know what you call them. Medical bags is what she calls them. Um, one of them's a veterinarian kit and the other one's for people. So yesterday I got, I don't know why they did this. I think they're trying to get us back. But in that kit, they put the long popsicle stick. You know what I'm talking about? You ever been to the doctor and they say, say, ah, and they stick it and they put your tongue down. Why you give that to a three-year-old, I don't know, because they don't know that you just lay it on the tongue. They do like a throat swab. They're like, say, ah, oh. daddy, say, ah. Oh. And I'm like, no, no. And like, I feel like I'm at the doctor's office about to get a shot. And here she comes and she's like gagging me. And she's like, okay, good job. I'm like, oh, yeah, you know, I'm dying here. But she came out and I said, you are a beautiful nurse. She said, I'm not a nurse. I'm a doctor. <laughs> You know, and I, I, I was sitting there, and I, you know, on Saturdays, try to replay and revisit what God's laid on my heart. And, um, and I thought to myself, oh my goodness, how easy would it be for me to train my daughter to be something God didn't create her to be? You know, and I know we're playing, and that's a little, little like, small little moment of excitement and joy, and it's not really a life-changing moment. 
But how often do we come in and we tell people just because they're going through a hard time, well, I wouldn't put up with that. Well, if that was my husband, I'd kick him to the curb. And if that was my girlfriend, I'd break up with her. Or you don't really want to be that. That doesn't pay that much. Do you really want to be that? Because there's a lot of hardship. Hey, I'm, I'm telling you this right now. We should not be messing with other people's identities. We just should be just trying to introduce them to the one that can bring them out of hiding and back into their purpose. And when Adam and Eve stood hidden and, they, and God said, hey, come here. All right, and I'm going to tell you this right now, and I need you to get this, whether you're watching online or not. If you want recovery or freedom in your life, at some point you got to stop hiding where you are and stand exposed before God, knowing that God will not leave you that way. You know, I, I love the fact that God doesn't look at Adam and Eve and say, see ya. God didn't walk away. He looked at them and said, they know they're naked, so I'll make solution. They know they're broken, so I'll cover them. And some of us in this place today, some of us watching online, our identity has been so hurt by our upbringing. And and I say this all the time. You may be a product of your past, but you do not have to be a prisoner of it. And our upbringing has pointed us this way, or, or maybe life has taken a different turn than you expected. Maybe you didn't deserve for them to walk out on you. Maybe, and nobody deserves that. Maybe you're, you're abused and you don't deserve those things. And it has beaten you into this mindset of, I got to stay hidden. And God is not calling you to stand exposed so he can shame you. God is calling you to stand exposed so that he can take the sacrifice of his son and clothe you so that you don't have to feel naked anymore. Hey, I'm going to tell you this all day long. Can you imagine if there had been other people in the garden? You know, I, I, let's say the, the garden had a church. What would that moment have sounded like for Adam and Eve? They stood before God naked, and then the church starts talking about how they should never be able to stand before God again. Well, God said that they should die. God said that if they ate, they should get death. I am so thankful today that the judgment's not up to me. It's not up to you. It's up to God, and God does not condemn. There is no condemnation in Christ. I don't care what you've done today. You have not done something bad enough to make God turn his back on you. When God turned his back, it was on Jesus so that he'd never have to turn his back on you. And God wants to clothe you in righteousness today. And you say, but what about, hey, what about it? Let's talk, what, what about your identity? If you keep your identity in you, then you're doomed. You need to take your identity and put it in Christ and what he's done so that you could be something different. Identity leads to purpose, right? What was Adam and Eve created for? Talk to me now. To worship God. Somebody else? To take care of the garden. Somebody else? Huh? Huh? Ah, to procreate. They were to have babies. What else? Okay, you're too smart. Break down, subdue. Okay, to manage creation. So God has said, hey, and and, and by the way, I heard a preacher preach this. Uh, To all you single people, I'm going to throw it out to you again. There were certain things about Adam you should look for in a partner. Right? Number one, he was made in the image of God. He fellowshiped with God. He did the job God called him to do. He lived in Eden, which means spot of God. In other words, his whole existence was centered around God. Everything he did, who he was, what he looked like, what he talked like, what he acted like, what he did for a living, and where he lived was all about God. And God looked at the person that was willing to live in his presence and said, that person shouldn't be alone. So he had a job, he had a purpose, he had the promise, he had everything. And so God said, I'm not gonna let that person be alone. I'll be honest with you, I'm gonna say this, I'm gonna say it boldly. Somebody that's not willing to live in the presence of God, somebody that's not willing to walk with God, somebody that doesn't know the promises of God, someone that doesn't have a relationship with God, and somebody that don't work, leave them alone. I mean, leave them alone. You, you say, well, I want to date them. I can change them. You cannot change them. I, I mean, how many of you have understood that you cannot change people easily? Say amen to me. Amen. I mean, can, how many of you have found that you can't even change your own habits sometimes? Am I right? Come on now. All right, Robbie, go over there, grab that chair off the end of that row and come up here. All right, I, I'm, I'm going to give you this. Sometimes in our purpose and in our identity and in our walk, we, 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 we believe that, okay, you know what? If I become this, then I'll feel better. If I become this, then I'll do this. And then we try to use other people to do that. Stand on that because if I stand on it, I'm going to break it. All right, so here it is. We use this analogy. I want you to get it in your mind. This is how some people date and create friendships and all these other things. 
They say, I'm going to find somebody that I like. And then I'm going to grow a relationship and hope that they become what I want. Come on now. We invite people to church and we hope they act like church people. It's by the way, that's why I never tell your kids to stop running in church. All right, now it got quiet. You know how many times I get told, there's a way you should behave in church. Yes, exactly. The same way you behave at home. The same way you behave in public. This is not God's house. Say that with me. Ready? This is not God's house. This is. And sometimes we want them to act away in here, but we don't care how they are acting in here. And we, and we want to look away and sound away and, well, this should be a place of reverence. I, I, hey, listen, if you don't have a devotional life, don't tell me where a place of reverence should be until you find one for yourself. All right? You say, well, that's me. No, I'm saying this right now. We have a, a good time at looking at people and saying, you should get to my level, so get me there. <laughs> All you did was show my fat roll. <laughs> okay. Is that going to happen? I mean, is it? Come on, let's be real. I'm 200 and some pounds. <laughs> How much do you weigh? Uh, 180. 180. What a jerk. All right, here we go. <laughs> now, now watch this. So easy. So easy to get you to where I am. And sometimes in life, we, we go in and we're like, God has called me. And today we're talking about being a witness. But we feel like God has called us to be the one that changes them. He says, okay, we're going to get here. Now, here's the truth. I've never done this before. Please work with me. <laughs> if he desires change in his life, this is how we should be. Am I right? Now, this is it. And here's the truth. If either one of us, because right now we're, we're co-supporting, if either one of us let go of the other, we're both in trouble. This is how church should be. This is called discipleship. Hey, when they walked by the guy laying by the gate begging for money, they said, we are broke like you. That's modern day language. Silver and gold, we don't have any. But what we do have, we will give you. And in the name of Jesus Christ, stand up and walk. And the Bible says, and they reached out their hand. And they said, let's get up. I'm going to tell you this right now. Without each other, we don't stay up. You know what God did when he clothed Adam and Eve? He put them back together with each other. But I promise you right now, if you're trying to be Jesus in your life and Jesus in other people's life, you will get pulled down way more than you'll pull people up. You and I can only testify to the goodness of God. So here's what it looks like. Go ahead and hop back down. We both start here. Let's let that represent. And by the way, there's no such thing as a pedestal. All right, please, this is not the analogy. If that's what you're getting, you're really messing up. There's no level. The only difference between you and a lost person is Jesus. You're the same sinner they are with the same brokenness they have. You have the same disease that they carry. You just have an antidote flowing through your veins. There's been an IV transfusion and God has inserted himself into you to help you combat what is you. Are you with me? Stop thinking of yourself as better than you are. Isn't that what Paul wrote? Use fair scales when you're judging yourselves. Look at each other right. And, and, and so it's like this. At one point in my life, God got me out of my pit and put me on this foundation. But can I be honest with you? How many of you came to Jesus on your own without any help? Raise your hand. Anybody got that testimony? One day you just woke up and all of a sudden realized you needed Jesus. Never heard a message about him. Never had a friend invite you to church. Never had somebody tell the story. You just knew you needed to be saved and you got saved. Anybody got that testimony? I'm going to take a moment. Look around. Scan the audience. Somebody point them out. If you see a hand, tell me. I don't see one. How many of you were introduced to Jesus through someone's message, somebody's testimony, somebody's witness, somebody's encouragement, somebody's invitation. Would you slip your hand up? How many of you were introduced? Yeah, exactly. Even I cannot get here by myself. You know what the Bible even says? The godly can stumble seven times, but get back up. That's Proverbs. 
You know how the Bible says we get back up? Galatians 6. Those of you who are mature in your faith, those of you who are elders, in other words, you've grown, you've matured, you've got about, you should help each other up. But you know what it says? When you're helping each other up, watch out that you don't fall into sin. I, I tell people this all the time. When God called us to resurrect people in Jesus' name, he didn't call us to tell everybody why they needed resurrecting. He didn't call us to say, well, did you hear what Robbie's done? Do you know who Robbie is? I'm going to tell you this right now. If God spent heaven telling everybody everything about us, we would all stand ashamed. But God did not create heaven to be the exposure of who we are. He created it to be an evolution and evolving around who he is. And so when God sent Christ to you and to me, he brought us a hope that even if we stumble, we can recover in Jesus' name. So here's the truth. My job as a believer is to tell him what Christ did for me. You remember last week we made this statement. Um, there's only two things you cannot do in heaven. Number one, sin. And number two, tell an unbeliever about Jesus Christ. Those are the only two things you can't do in heaven. Can I tell you this right now? Which one of those two things do you think God wanted you to do with your life? That's what we asked you last week. Do you think he called you to sin? Or do you think he has you on this earth to tell someone about him? You know, we do this every now and then. How many of you have overcome drugs in your life? Throw your hand in the air. Give God a praise. All right? Hopefully you got more praise than that. Give God a praise. How many of you have overcome it? Give it that. How many of you have come overcome um, sexual sins in your life? Throw it up here. All right, how many of you have overcome abuse? How many have been rescued and delivered? Yeah. How many of you have overcome a, a, a childhood that was so anti-Christ that, 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 that you never heard of him, never saw him, it wasn't lived in front of you? How many of you have been delivered from that darkness into a home now where Christ lives and resides in you? Yeah, amen. Look at that. I mean, how many of us today, if we looked and examined our lives, would say, God has brought me out? Would you slip a hand up in the air? Hey, God has brought me out. So today, as we look at this and as we examine these stories, I want you to understand that some of us today are trying to play God instead of letting God be made known through our lives. Amen. And you may not even know that. That's not meant to be mean. That's not meant to say, you stop being God. Sometimes you try to be God and you're not trying to be God. You're just trying to help. How many of you have poured your resources and time and effort and energy into somebody only to find yourself completely depleted and exhausted? You know why? Because God did not ask you to pour yourself out. He asked you to make him known. And so he says, hey, pour me out. Does God want your effort, energy, and emotions? Yes. But is God going to bankrupt you to deposit into somebody else's account? No. I tell people this all the time. God will not hurt you to help somebody. Right? What good does it do if you have $20 left and somebody needs 20 bucks, and you gave it to them. Now, there's a difference when God lays it on your heart, and you know it. Use discernment. But what good does it do for you not to be able to pay your bills because you paid somebody else's? Do you think God's going to bankrupt you because he loves somebody else more than you? No. And so I'm going to tell you this. I feel like the church is exhausted in some areas because for far too long, we've tried to change our communities instead of just bringing Jesus into them. And so today, we're going to examine very quickly, all right, <laughs> that's a, I'm open. I'm halfway through. All right. So for all of you that come here and are laughing at me because you think that's a lie, we're going to try to, in very few points, tell you how to make Christ known. This is called your testimony. Write it down. You are called number five in our list. We've talked about it. May God your focus, number one, right? Fellowship with other believers. Hey, we put these all out there. Hey, we need people that are going to say, okay, God, I'm going to not just give you my identity. I'm going to realize that the purpose of which you've created me is to be in a relationship with you and be in a relationship with others so that they, through that relationship, can come to know a relationship with you. And that leads us to the third thing of timing, right? And so let's close this down. You ready for it? All right, for those of you in our youth group, we call this missionary dating. Stop missionary dating. Start saying, stop saying, hey, well, you know what? Maybe I can change them. Because you can go interview about 100 people that are married to the person they thought they could change. And they may have been married five years, 10 years, or 100 years, and they've realized they still can't change them. Am I right? I don't know why I put my hand on your head and left it there like this, man. That's so awkward. All right, your face is even more weird. All right, so we're gonna let you go. All right, so give Robbie a hand. Thanks for coming. You take the chair with you. 
All right, here it is. Look at this verse with me, if you would. Matthew 16, verse 24 and 25. We left off with this one last week. It was our closer verse. We're gonna pick up with it this week. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if any of you wants to be my follower, we said this, you number one, must give up your life. That's called surrender. Not my way, your way. All right, take up your cross. That's service. That's what we talked about. You're called to serve, all right? And you must follow me. That's obedience. He said, if you hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. How many of you remember I brought Jeremiah up here last week with a water bottle? He squeezed his life out because he was trying to be in control. And then we kept refilling that life. That's what God does. He says, hey, it, give me the life because if you try to hold on to it, what you try to keep, you'll lose. Right? And we'll say this. If you are in fear of losing something, you normally become controlling. Some of you have been called controlling by your partner. And it's not that you're a controlling person. You're afraid. All right. Am I right? And as I get afraid, I try to hold on. That's what the water bottle was. And as I hold on and somebody, if I feel like somebody's going to take it, I start squeezing the life out of it. And then you wonder, well, why doesn't this person love you? It's not that they don't love you. It's you're not letting them be in their identity. You're not letting them live out their purpose. All right. Do we do this to our kids? That's a good question. I mean, raising kids is difficult, right? Right. You were one of those at one point, right? No, never. Never. Some of you, just because it's been a few centuries ago doesn't mean you weren't there, right? All right, no, I'm just kidding. Um, I, I, I didn't even look at Tammy when I said that. All right, so the thing is, is understand this, get it. Just, just because it's been a long time since you've been there, we had challenges too as kids. Were they the same? No. Is there always gonna be a new evolution of how challenges present themselves? Yes. Hey, by the way, Satan's an idiot if he comes after you today the same way he came after you yesterday. Now, the only way he'll do that is if you gave in yesterday. So he'll keep using that until that runs out. Do you think Satan's been in existence as long as the world's been in creation? Do you think he hasn't tried to master how he manipulates people? All right? Some of you, if Satan showed up and says, bite this apple, you're going to be like, uh, no, brownie maybe, but not the apple, right? So the thing is, it's like, you got to know your audience. We, we would totally shut it down. So God's, we don't see a serpent in the tree saying, come eat. But we, we might see the serpent on the internet saying, come watch. We might see the serpent on the phone saying, did you hear? All right, yeah, I understand this. He's gonna come in the way that he thinks he can get in. And if you shut the door yesterday to that, he ain't coming at you that way. He's gonna find something new. All right, some of you have come out of addiction, but have you come out of despair? Because here's the truth. Satan will not, hey, oh, I can't get you to shoot up anymore. I can't get you to drink anymore. I can't get you to sleep around anymore. You should be ashamed that you ever did. And so the next thing he starts doing is not, hey, you need to do this. But, oh man, can you believe you did that? He starts abusing us with that. How many of you have ever had something held over your head that they wouldn't let go? Didn't you love it? Yeah, wasn't that the best thing? You're like, I'm so glad you're holding that over my head. I'm so glad every argument, you remind me of that. It makes me feel on top of the world. How many of you hate it when somebody holds something over your head? You know, and and, and they keep reminding you of it. You know what? Satan loves to abuse. By the way, if you're doing that to somebody else, then you're playing on the wrong team. All right, Uh, I'm, I'm gonna tell you this. I want you to get it. God will not use guilt and shame to change your life. He'll use conviction, but he will not use guilt and shame. And if today you feel dirty and you're constantly being made to feel dirty, and if people around you are making you feel dirty, they're not speaking on God's behalf. They're speaking on their own opinion. And you need to tune into God's word because God's word will set you free. But not only does it set you free, it removes the despair. Didn't we sing a hymn just a second ago about how he took our shame? Didn't we sing and celebrate a little bit ago how he removed these things from us? Hey, some of us need to understand that the enemy may not be able to trip you back into that sin. He's going to try. But if he realizes he can't, he will definitely abuse you with that sin. That's why you need the words of God echoing more than the words of the enemy in your life. Um, And by the way, the enemy has so many ways to get his word to you. Um, He can tweet it. Facebook it, instant messenger, Instagram it, Snapchat. He, 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 can, he can put it on the news. He can, he can actually even use the Bible. Um, by, by the way, how many of you would agree that the Bible is the most powerful resource we possess as Christians? Say amen to me. Come on now. How many of you believe that? Can I tell you this now? It is also one of the most dangerous tools that we could have against us. You say, well, he's making the Bible a bad thing. No, Satan did. Remember when Jesus was being tempted for 40 days in the wilderness? What did Satan come after him with? Scripture. He said, hey, you know what, dude? If you'll bow down right here, I'll give you everything. 
Was Jesus supposed to lay down his life? Yes, but not to the enemy. You know, hey, if you'll jump off this thing, commit suicide. Was Jesus supposed to die? Yes, but he wasn't supposed to kill himself. Are you, fine? Are you all with me? Hey, you know, you, you, you can command and you can do this. You can turn this, this, this stone into a piece of bread. You can do this. You're, I'll give you everything. Some of us are falling for that trick. Satan will come at you with scripture. I, I have seen Christians use scripture to try to abuse other Christians. I, I, I have seen the word of God so manipulated that we take the grace out of it. I remember sitting in a service where we were in the recovery process of our family. And I remember sitting in that service and a person literally reading scripture uh, in, in, in the worship set about the condemnation of God staring at me. And it was my first time back after my fall. And they literally read it staring at me. And I leaned over to my wife because they stopped on a verse that if they'd have kept reading the next six verses, God would have totally restored everything up here. But they stopped. Why? Because if we can remove the grace of God, we can control you. But the truth is, the grace of God means that no human has control of you. Nobody who knows your history can keep you from your purpose. That's the whole Adam and Eve story. You're created to reproduce. You're created to be in a relationship with me. You're created to garden. And so what happens? Now reproduction is hard. Gardening is hard, but you're still a gardener. You're still reproducing. I'm still God, and you're still mine. Hey, I'll tell you this right now. You may have lost an opportunity, but you cannot lose your purpose. Because your purpose wasn't written by you. Your purpose was designed by him. Isn't that a good, no, isn't it a good news to grab in your heart? I remember going to a wedding, and a lady, I sat down at a table with a, uh, uh, my wife, and, and I think it was Ashley Jones and Richie Coffey's uh, uh, wedding. Now it's Ashley Coffey, right? And, and I remember sitting down so nervous, and, and, and I sat down with somebody I hadn't seen in a couple of years, did not know how that was going to go. You know what they did, though, by the way? When we walked into the, um, I almost called it the viewing, um, it, 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 it was not a funeral, all right? <laughs> when we walked into the reception, they called out and said, Come sit with me. You know, when somebody's nervous and hurting, somebody's ashamed, one of the best things that can happen in their life is an invitation. Come sit with me. And as soon as we sit down, they open their Bible to Romans and slid it across the table and said, read that verse. And it said, the gifts and the callings of God are without repentance. In other words, and they said, God doesn't call you and gift you to take it back. He calls you and gifts you and it's permanent. And some of you need to understand that. You had an abortion, but God still called you and gifted you, and you're still his. You've had the divorce. You've had the breakup. You've, you've had the shameful thing. You've had the thing that the world looks at you or the church looks at you and says you can never be. The gifting and the calling of God are without repentance. God doesn't sit up there and say, DJ, I made a mistake with you. I, I shouldn't have called you to do that. No, God knew what you were capable of, knew what you were going to do, called you anyway because he had already made a solution for your messes. Now, does that give us an invitation to sin? No. If you're loved today, you should pursue love, not the opposite. You, you shouldn't be trying to go against God. Adam and Eve, hey, can I tell you this? Hey, let's talk. After they ate the fruit, is there any other sin that they committed recorded? I want you to think. After Adam and Eve ate the fruit, does the Bible hold any other sin in history that they did? No, because God isn't interested in where you've been. He's interested in where you're going. <laughs> Can I tell you this? There would have been people that would have kept a dialogue journey of everything that they got wrong since the fall. But you know what God did? God said, hey, this is the sin that made you fall. This is the grace that got you up. And today, I think you need to understand this. You've been beating yourself up far too long. You've been holding yourself down far too long. It is time that you get up, take up your cross, surrender your life, give it up. Some of us surrendering our lives doesn't mean that we recommit to the Lord. Some of us means we give up our shame. Some of it means we give up our, 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 our well, and be honest, I, I've, I've been to AA, I've, I've been to, not NA, but I've been to recovery setting. I, I, I've been taught and I've been trained and I've told you this before. Stop identifying, hey, my name is Josh and I'm a recovering alcoholic. No, I am Josh. I had alcohol in my life. Jesus is in my life. He's helping keep alcohol out. I'm pursuing him. I'm in a recovery process, but I am not Josh the alcoholic. I'm Josh, son of God. Hey, I am not this. You are not what you've done. 
You are what God has done for you. And God has radically redeemed you. That's your story. Our testimony isn't, look how bad life has been. Our testimony is, from the ashes, he can make masterpieces. From the brokenness, he can make whole. I don't know if you're here today and need to hear that he can do that in your life, or if you're here today that maybe you need to reword the dialogue of your testimony. Because as we witness, it's not about who we are. It's about who he is. Look at 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 20. It says, and all of this is a gift of God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. Reconciling is a big word of, of restoring back the relationship. Okay? So he's saying, hey, God saw we were separated and sent Jesus to bring us back to him. Simple illustration. All right? Um, I always call on people. You two come up here. Is that, is that okay? Y'all come up here. DJ, bring your mama. I'm going to take her too. She probably ain't going to like this, but I'm going to take her. A very humble lady. Okay, you go over there, Rachel. You go over here. I'm going to let you be the good in-law for once, okay? So DJ, you go over here. All right, DJ is married to Rachel. You're over there. All right, and this is mom or mom-in-law, right? So here it is. Sometimes our relationships are like this. Would you agree? In the ministry of reconciliation, God's design of this relationship is to be together. And so if, if we were an instrument of reconciliation, let's change the narrative for a second. Let's let this be God. No, let's let that be God, all right? I'm not going to give him the power, all right? There you go, all right. And let's let you represent Christ. Get over your gender things if you're freaked out by this. All right, so here it is. The Bible says that these two are one. They're tight. But they really want that one. I mean, heaven could have totally turned its back on the earth and still been heaven. But this could have never been heaven. As desperately as we wanted it, as desperately as we need it, I think there's a desire in every person to be better than they are. There's a di- desire for good. I, I, I was talking to an atheist the other day. And they're like, you'll never convince me that there's the presence of God, that there's a presence of his goodness. There's a presence of this. And I said, then, then, then explain evil. You don't want to talk about God, but how is there evil if there's not goodness? And, and, and how can you say that we're just in a world that's evil? Well, the world's not evil, but is the world got a lot of brokenness in it? Yes. Is there murder in it? Yes. Is there rape in it? Is there child abuse? Is there, is there death? Is there all these things? Yes. Yes. So evil exists. You, or you think those are good things. Those are not good things. Those are bad things. Okay. So you're telling me that those are not good things. So good things would be no abuse. Good things would be no child is ever treated poorly. Good things would be that nobody ever died. Yes, that would be goodness. So you're telling me that there is a good and there is an evil. So there has to be a presence of both. Well, yes. So how does evil get conquered? If there is no good. Now, and I'm, I'm going to tell you this. I believe in our lifetimes, there's been moments where we're separated from God through the things we do and the things that we say. There's moments we're not where we want to be. Can I ask you, who in here is where they want to be in all these areas? Mentally? In other words, your mind is okay at peace at all times. You have no fears, no anxieties, no worries. Spiritually, meaning you don't get it wrong. That, yeah, that you literally could stand by Jesus and we'd be like, which one's which? Right? Um, relationally, meaning all your relationships are exactly where they want to be. And Physically. You have the waistline, the cholesterol, the energy level that you want. Who can say in all four of those areas, you're where you want to be? Anybody in here say, I got some things I need to do and some, maybe you're better here than you are here, but there needs to be a balance in your life. I don't know. I I, I mean, I I need to balance some things out. In other words, there's times in my life that I'm like, you know what? I'm, I'm thankful for the wife I have and the children that I have, and I'm thankful for my church family. So relationship-wise, I'm thankful for what's in my life, and that feels pretty good. But 
you brought up my waistline. And that's a whole different story, right? Don't touch my waistline. <laughs> All right? No, just, you brought up my mental state. And, and sometimes I'm my own worst enemy. I'm the biggest abuser in the world. It's right here. <laughs> uh, come on. I so want to be there. My grandma's there. The lady that believed in me and put God in front of me is there. Some of the heroes that I've had in my faith that have led me to the Lord and stood beside me, they're there. Through those two years of COVID, I lost so many people I love. I don't know about you, but I want to go to that place to where there is no more pain, no more sorrow, but there is just Jesus in the way that God really intended for it to be. I want to go to that place where I know my daughter, my two sons are never going to be misused. That I'm never going to have to try to desperately find a way to heal a broken heart. As something happens in their life that's out of my control. I don't know about you, but heaven sounds really good. And I would love to look Jesus in the face. And just to know. Not to just hear about and witness through others and experience his love. But to know that I am in that love and that love is never going away. You say, you should know that now. Come on now. How many of you walk around perfect all the time feeling like you have the love of God abounding in your life? I know it's there. How many of you say, I believe it's there. But how many times does the world get your attention? And then, and the next thing you, you, you forget and you, you, start, you, you start reminiscing on how bad life is instead of remembering how good God's been. Heaven's a good place. God in his infinite love Never ending. Paul said, I wish you could know how high, how deep, how wide, how long. Wish you could try to measure God's love and realize that you don't have a tape that long. I wish you could explore God's love and, and realize you don't have a life long enough to get to the edge of it. A sin great enough to separate you from it. No, no power of this world, no evil, nothing can separate you from the love of God. And God one day... Realize that in his mind, here's the beauty of it. That heaven, even in its perfection, is not perfect without you. Because God didn't create a hobby. He created a love language. He created a relationship through Adam and Eve. And that it would no longer be settled here because in his heart, a part of himself is there. He created Adam by hand. Everything else spoken. But Adam, what I love is you can hit your knees for God knowing that God first hit his knees for you. And as he breathed into his nostrils, life, he gave part of who he is. Can you, can you get this? His heart is not whole without you. And so God said, this won't be heaven without him so God in his love says you gotta go you gotta go tell him that he can come here this is reconciliation to make right what is wrong to bring back what is broken to, to restore what has been lost and so in his love he says I will put myself in you so that you through me, and come here. Are you following you with me? This is the story of you. So one day, I was a mess, and he sent the Messiah. One day, I was, I was worthless, and he sent the worthy one. And those of you who are dead in your trespasses of sin, he has quickened, he has made right, he has rescued, he reached into the depths of the miry clay and he pulled you out and he put you on a firm foundation. Peter, in the book of Peter, we find that he will strengthen you, support you, stabilize you, stand with you and give you a firm foundation. Why? Because God's heart beats for you today. And the Bible says that, hey, I had to reconcile. So let's say it's DJ the husband, it's Rachel the wife, 
Sometimes we get separated. And you know what God calls us to do as mother-in-laws, as father-in-laws, as friends? Not to come in here and say, oh man, I don't know how you do this. But to say, hey man, I called somebody yesterday. I said, where are you? I'm not home. I just talked to your wife. You need to get home. Why? Because the longer you stay gone, the more the enemy's talking to her. The longer you stay gone, her fears are running out of control. Well, it's not true. You're making it true. The lie that the enemy's telling her, if it's not true, get home and be the truth. Because the longer you're gone, the more his truth is echoing in her mind. Get home. Well, I got to leave out of town and I'm, I'm probably going to leave early. Don't leave tonight. Get home. I, I'm, I'm going to tell you this right now. Lose a job before you lose your family. Lose a job before you lose your kids. Hey, lose a job before you lose your testimony. Lose a job before you lose the ability to stand and tell the name of God. We need Christians that say, hey, we have been called to bring people back to God. To reconcile. And so a mother-in-law's job is to say, hey, come here, man. You're not thinking this through. You, you may be 42, but your mom can still wear you out, right? Like, you know, like, you, you, you got to get back. Y'all can have a seat. Listen to this. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. No longer counting people's sins against them. He gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. Is he appealing? That's the question I got in my life. I sat there and I read that and I, I wept over that verse. Because there's been times in my life that I haven't made God appealing in the way that I've lived, in the way that I talk. By the way, two ways you share your witness. Ready? Your words and your lifestyle. If you started talking about Jesus at work, would people hate Jesus because of how you are at work? If you started talking about Jesus at home, would your kids turn off and hate Jesus because of how you are at home? I hated God for years because of how my home life was. My dad was my pastor. The thing is, is I'm, I'm going to tell you this right now. We need a world that understands that the words of our mouths, the meditations of our hearts should be pleasing to God. But it's through our words and our lives that God is made known. God is making his appeal through him. Is God appealing to others through you? We speak for Christ when we plead. Somebody say it with me. Come back to God. Now, listen. I'm not even, I did lie when I said quickly. I don't even think I've given you point one. The truth is this. The church is weak when it comes to sharing Jesus. I'm weak when it comes to sharing Jesus. I'm not talking about on a Sunday morning when we stand here and we lift hands and we do this. I shared with y'all four weeks ago when we started this series. How a man almost died in my front yard. And about 20 minutes before he almost died, I was in a conversation with him and did not even think about Jesus. I talked real estate and not Jesus. Now, thanks be to God, he's alive. Collapsed lung, broken ribs, broken back, broken spine, <laughs> fractured sternum, hip. But he's alive. And his wife's a believer. We've been connected. Jordan's been Facebooking back and forth. And I told Jordan, as soon as we can, we are going to them. And we are telling them and asking them. Because even though they put on Facebook that they love God and Pray for my husband and all this. We are the message between people's eternity. Heaven and hell are real places. And we are the ambassador with the message. You don't have to go there. A hell was not made for you. Even the Bible says it was made for the Satan and the demons that fell. But it's real. And if we don't tell them, they'll go. 
And I sometimes can talk and preach and do all these things from a stage. But when I'm sitting at a table at a restaurant and God convicts me to witness, I get scared to death. I even in my own mind start thinking, they're going to think I'm weird. Or this isn't the appropriate time. And I didn't want to share that with you as a pastor because, you know, in our minds, we want to be spiritual leaders. But spiritual leading sometimes says, I don't get it right. And sometimes I can talk about things of worthlessness like sports and all this other stuff with people way faster than I can ask them the simple question of, do you know Jesus? And the Bible doesn't say that God made us his ambassadors so that we could go to people and casually say, or that we can go to people and randomly say, or so that we could go to people and just every now and then, or when it feels right, or when we're in the right mood or at the right point, we can say, come back to God. It says, no, God put us on this. And he's making his appeal through us. And as we speak, we plead, we beg, we, 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 we're going after them. Jude said, we're plucking them as brands from the burning. We need a church that's passionate about the souls of people so that we say, hey, come back to God, not so that we can put a report out at the end of the year of how many have been saved and baptized, so that we can know that your soul is secure, that you've got hope and help in this world, that you've got a heaven ahead of you. We need a generation of believers today that are hoping and praying and seeking that God would save lost people through their testimonies. Too many people are dying. I've said it before, I'll say it again. If you had the cure to cancer, to AIDS. If you had the cure to dementia and you kept it to yourself, that would be criminal. But you have an eternal message, an eternal antidote for the greatest disease known to mankind, and that is sin. It is criminal to know that there is a way to heaven and not share that way with someone. Our message is simple. God teaches us how to get a past forgiven. I, I love how Rick says this. A past forgiven, a purpose for living, and a future in heaven. Hey, God will wipe away your slate. God will give you purpose for today. He'll bring heaven to earth, and one day, he'll bring earth to heaven. We need to get the message out there. Bow your heads, close your eyes. I'm just going to end it right here. Through your words, through your life, through visual, through audio, God has called people to himself. Visual and audio. I'm going to give you this while your head's bowed and eyes closed. A way to be a witness, pray for people. Pray for their hearts and that God would give you passion for their souls. Number two, invite people to church events, small groups, to your church. Invite them to your home. Invite them. Like that lady sitting at the table. Come sit with me. Jesus is calling from heaven the same to you. Come dine with me. Share your story. Again, your story is not what you did. It's what Christ did for you. How has God changed your life? Tell somebody. How has God shaped your way of thinking. Tell somebody. And remember this, you don't have to do it alone. God gave you a family, a church family, to help. How many of you know someone that's lost? Or maybe you don't know if they're saved. How many of you know somebody like that? Slip their hand up. Say, what's my purpose in life? Them. Them. Reach out to them. Share with them. Be a witness. I promise you, God will take his story and make it known through you. That they will see your good works and they will glorify your Father in heaven. God will use you. If you want a life that's a threat to hell, the time is now. 
The time is now to make God the center of your life. The time is now to be committed to God's family. The time is now to make sure you're maturing and growing in God. The time is now to serve others. The time is now to share Jesus. It's now. I wrote a scripture that's a prayer that I'm going to close with. And this is our prayer for our church. 2 Corinthians 6 verse 1. As God's partners, we beg you not to accept this marvelous gift of God's kindness and then ignore it. For God says, at just the right time I heard you. On the day of your salvation I helped you. Indeed, the right time is now. Today is the day of salvation. I pray that we will not be a church that has accepted his marvelous gift of salvation and then ignore it. I don't normally give invitations, but I'm going to. I'm going to ask Casey to play. And let me correct that. I only give them if I feel God calling it. I would love to see a church that's willing to get on their knees and surrender their lives to reach someone. And if you today raised your hand and said, I've got somebody that I know or I don't know, whether they're saved or I know they're not, I'm going to ask you if you're physically able to join us at an altar and not to pray that God would use your life to reach the many, but that God would give you the courage and conviction to reach out to the one. One person. Andrew met Jesus. And after he saw Jesus' miracles and saw his wonderfulness, he went out and got his brother. And his brother radically changed the world because Andrew saw Jesus and knew his brother needed Jesus too. Your life has been changed. Many of you, I know your story, and many of you have heard you testify. Many of you, I saw you raise your hands just a few minutes ago and celebrate the change that God has brought into your life. Hey, listen, you've seen how good he is. Your brothers, your sisters, your moms, your aunts, your uncles, your dads, your family members, your friends, your coworkers, they need to see how good he is too. And if we're going to change the world by reaching them through Christ, we've got to do it one person at a time. So I'm going to ask you, would you leave your seat? Not for you, but for them. And come put their name at an altar and say, God, use me to reach them. Would you come right now? Would you come and join these that are always coming? Come from the balcony. Come from the floor. Would you come? May our hearts beat for lost people. May our hearts beat for lost people.